So first off, we have to say that Treasure Island was originally a story from 1881 to 1882, and it was written by Robert Louis Stevenson, and it was originally called The Sea Cook, A Story for Boys, which was serialised in the children's magazine Young Folks. Now, Stevenson was inspired by the Devon coast, which explains why the setting for the story was in the 18th century west coast of England. And the book ended up being hugely popular in its day, even to the point where Prime Minister Gladstone ended up being such a fan, he would stay up all night to read it. Which, you know, he's the Prime Minister, so he probably should be doing some other work, but, you know, it shows how popular the book was in its day. Now, when Disney took an interest in the story back in the 1930s, he decided that it was to be adapted, but largely kept the same, as many of the themes were still relevant to boys in the 1950s as they were in the 1880s. So more on that a little bit later when we talk about the themes and the history of the book. So that concludes the story of the creative process, but now we have to talk about the story of the studio. So this film here ended up being Disney's first ever fully live action film, although as early as the 1930s, Disney had originally wanted the film to be a fully animated film, which was his intention all the way up until the late 1940s, when he ended up buying the rights to the film from Metro Golden Meyer, MGM, in 1949 as a fully live action film. So the film was filmed by RKO slash Walt Disney British Productions and it was filmed exclusively in England. So all the shots that you can see of the actual uh, background stuff that was actually filmed along the west coast of England. However, we should say that the European film industry at the time was incredibly protectionist and so as a result of that basically there ended up being lots of hurdles that the film ended up coming up against. So most notably of all is the fact that Bobby Driscoll, who is the person who plays Jim in this, he of course is American. And everyone else in the film is British because this was the rule that they had at the time that only British actors could be in British films unless they got a special permit. So Bobby didn't end up getting a permit uh, and so he was actually violating British labour laws at the time. And on top of that, it was the fact of even if he had gone through a process of getting a permit, he was two years too young in order to actually be qualified for a permit. So he had to be 16, he was still about 13, 14 at the time of making this film. And so as a result of that, yeah, he, you know, he got himself into a bit of trouble and the British authorities actually said that he had six weeks to leave the country, which meant the director, who was Brian Haskin, had to shoot all of his close-ups within that six week period and had to use a British stand-in for the other scenes. So Driscoll's fine and ban end up really affecting his future career prospects. And although he ended up being the voice of Peter Pan in Peter Pan from 1953, definitely go and check that video out. It ended up being a thing where he kind of struggled with his career afterwards. And actually how he ended up was not in a very good place. We have the description on screen at the moment. And yeah, by age 31, he ended up dying. And so you could argue that other things might have contributed to that, of course. But this film and the hullabaloo around it certainly contributed to it. So that unfortunately <laughs> ties in very nicely with the casting for the film. So of course, like we just said, uh, Bobby Driscoll is the person who plays Jim. But the person who plays Long John Silver is Robert Newton. So he appeared in many different films, which you can see on screen at the moment. But most notably of all, he was Blackbeard in Blackbeard the Pirate from 1952. And also he was Long John Silver in the film of the same name, which came out in 1954. So we should say that his voice here and like the accent that he really played up. So he's from the West Country and he really played up this West Country accent. This here actually typifies what we think of as the uh, pirate accent, right? So even if you look at Pirates of the Caribbean, if you look at uh, Captain Barbosa, the accent that he has is pretty much identical to the accent that Long John Silver has in this film, so he must have got a lot of inspiration from it. Next, we have to talk about Captain Smollett, who was played by Basil Sidney. So he appeared in Dan Busters from 1955, King Claudius, and also he appeared in Hamlet from 1948. Next, we have to talk about Squire Trelawney, who is played by Walter Fitzgerald, and he appeared in Around the World in 80 Days from 1956, and actually quite a lot of the actors within this also appeared within that film as well. Next we have to talk about Dr. Livesey, and he is played by Dennis O'Shire, who is just a minor Irish actor who happened to appear in many different films. 
Next, we have to talk about Captain Billy Jones, who is played by Finley Curry, and he appeared in a multitude of films. Most notable of all was Ben Hur from 1959. Next, we have to talk about Ralph Truman, who is the person who plays George Merry, and again, he appeared in Ben Hur, and he also appeared in The Man Who Knew Too Much, which is a classic Hitchcock film from 1956. Next, you have to talk about Israel Hans, uh, so he's one of the minor pirates in this, and he was played by Jeffrey Keane. And Jeffrey Keane played the Minister of Defence within many of the Jane Bond films from 1977 to 1987. Next, you have to talk about Blind Pew, and he was played by John Lowry, so this is actually uh, in Dad's Army, he is Private Fraser. And then finally, we have to talk about Francis de Wolf, who is the person who plays Black Dog in this. And again, he appears as the villain in many different James Bond films. And we should also say that there's a multitude of other actors in this. However, we'd be here all day talking about like, you know, what films they were in and stuff. So for now, we're just going to have them all on screen, as you can see. So, of course, that concludes the story of the studio. And now let's talk about the themes and the history of the film. So the themes within this very, very clearly are that of childhood, especially with regard to boyhood. So we should note that within the whole of this film, there are no female characters because, you know, just like the original story was called, it's a story for boys. It's very much tied in with themes of adventure. You know, you've got the desert islands, you've got all the you know, pirates, etc, etc. It's a very kind of much a coming of age uh, film for young boys and it's kind of targeted exclusively at them. So the fact that there's no girls in this at all, like apart from like in the background and stuff at certain shots when they're in Bristol, it kind of, you know, really demonstrates that, yeah, this is a kid film, but it's very much a boy's film. And I think that this ties in with the legacy of this as well. So, of course, every single uh, pirate film which come out after this point is very much tied in with this. So we've already mentioned Pirates of the Caribbean, but pretty much every film uh, to do with pirates since then has been influenced by this film. And actually you can see this within the legacy of the film. So the budget for this was only $1.8 million, but at the box office of that year, it ended up bringing in 4.1 million worldwide. And actually within the US and Canada alone, it raised $2.1 million. So you can see it's a very, very popular film and actually they ended up doing a sequel of this, which was Long John Silver in 1954. However, what's interesting about that is that it wasn't actually a Disney film. For some reason, it was actually made by Australians, right? So a little bit strange with that, but either way. 